<laughs> okay. Well, last week we uh, basically stopped at uh, looking, well, um, looking at the subqueries, and obviously we've done two subqueries. One as if it's a view, so um, it's as if it's a different select, different table. And then we also done a top query uh, where we actually output in the result of that query as a parameter. And we looked at the execution plan and found out that what it's doing is pretty retarded um, because it's basically almost like a nested loop uh, that loops through work orders, uh, the number of products we, uh, we have in the data set and selecting each one of them separately, effectively. So what I wanted to uh, do today is um, go sort of even deeper into subquery and uh, introduce a new uh, sort of syntax, well, syn uh, syntax uh, in the ESCO server we've got uh, that helps us to do the subqueries in a more coherent way and more readable way and more reusable way. It's called width. And um, we're going to start looking at grouping and aggregating results as well. Uh, as we go along through all those uh, queries, we're going to look at the execution plans and see how we can actually improve them and uh, if we can spot any well, any problems with the execution uh, of the query that we constructed. Okay, so last week we basically st stopped at this query and uh, what I wanted to do is to introduce a new thing. Um, obviously we have this subquery uh, within the brackets and um, it almost acts as a view in our case, but SQL Server allows us to do, uh, well, to define this subquery in a more coherent way. Also, if I wanted to use exactly the same table, exactly the same view again in my query, sometimes I need to, let's say, create a, well, a great create a view and join to it multiple times based on multiple parameters, then I would have to basically define this again. So I would have to do exactly the same thing if I wanted to join by product ID again uh, to an inventory, let's say where it's, where it's five, I would have to do it again. Uh, with the syntax OL syntax that we have in SQL Server in TSQL is called with. And what we can do, so I'm just going to go and copy this. Okay, it's pretty much exactly the same thing. But I'm going to insert a new query at the top so we can compare both. So instead of actually putting this subquery in the inner join and basically define it like this, um, I can do with, then give that table a name, and then specify which columns I want, and then specify the view. This is my subquery, and uh, well, obviously select those columns out of it. And then I can reuse this table in entry four in my inner join as if it's a normal table or as if it's a view. So it's almost like creating a, a constructing a, a dynamic views within your SQL statement. Okay, so it does exactly the same job as this, but now it's more kind of readable because first of all, we actually define all the views that we want in our query, and then we can use them down there. So obviously I can join to this table again, and it's absolutely fine. Uh, give it a new name. So instead of defining the same subquery again, I can just basically define it with uh, up there, and then I can use it down there. Okay. So again, if we just execute this, uh, we'll look at the execution plan, and we can compare that execution plan with the execution plan we had for uh, this query. Okay. Can we do two plans at the same time? Sorry? Okay, so if we actually compare those two execution plans, you can see they're exactly the same. It just makes it easier for, for us to read the SQL statement and also to actually write it as well. And whenever we need to change it, we know where all our subqueries are instead of just going into them um, every single time. Okay. So it's quite a useful thing. Um, okay. Uh, notice that I also put option uh, recompile at the back. 
uh, at the end of every single query. That's actually not necessary when you actually write your SQL uh, queries, but in our case, what I want to do is to make sure that I don't cache any of the execution plans so that we can, so I'm pretty sure that it's gonna generate a new one and we're not gonna end up with something that's been cached and I'm looking very puzzled when I'm looking at them. Um, anyhow, so it's just plug exactly the same. And um, what we can do with subqueries as well is we can include both, I um, mean, two subqueries in there. So for example, when you need two subqueries, uh, what we can do is this, pretty much just an extension of the same query. Right. In fact, so what I can do is this, uh, I don't know, I can start to find another query up there. Where was I? Okay, so almost like basically another table and uh, come out with some columns, etc. So if we go back to my initial query, remember I've got this really retarded, um, well, not retarded, let's not call it retarded, it's just a uh, very non performance friendly uh, subquery that basically for every product it will get me a due date for that product. So ideally I need to rewrite this. How can I rewrite this? Any idea? <laughs> Any suggestions? What can I do to actually rewrite this? I mean, rewrite this query to be more performance friendly. Wow. <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, what I can do is I basically can create a, a, a view from work order where I'm going to include product ID and the latest due date for it, and then join to that table actually, right? instead of just going through every single product and reselecting it from the work order, I can create that view with all the products, all the due dates, and then join to it, and I get my due date. Okay, so that's pretty much what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna delete the previous one. It's exactly the same the previous one where I, uh, the software where I select the uh, inventory levels. And then I also, you know, comment delimit it, Let's put it in the next row. And it's almost the same as with, basically, but here I'm creating a new view called work order, uh, where I'm gonna get due date and a product ID columns. And here, this is the grouping that I'm gonna do. From work order, I'm gonna select all the product IDs and the maximum, here, max, due date. So, I'm grouped by product, obviously. This is, the, this is an aggregate, right? If I execute this, for every product, I get the maximum due date for it. Okay, so that becomes almost like a another table that I've created on the fly, and then I can join to it. Here, I'm doing the join to it, left out the join because I want all the products to be shown, uh, whether they have the work order for them or not. If they don't have any work order, I'm going to show null, and um, yeah, I'm just effectively just join by product ID to that. Table. If we execute this, uh, look at our execution plan, we should see that it's a lot better now. So first of all, in fact, let's go and compare those two execution plans so that we can see what uh, the difference between them. So this is the previous one that I had. It's a new one. Hey. Okay, so the previous one, and the, the first one where I had the subquery for every single product uh, running, we can see there's a nested loop somewhere, yeah, right there. And it's, okay, the nested loop itself doesn't cost us anything, but it's very deceptive because what it actually costs us is iterating through every single work order every time. As you can see, it's right there. This is the, ma this is the cost that's being generated by a nested loop. The nested loop itself doesn't actually cost us anything. So the actually selection of data from product and uh, you know joining to product inventory is compared to doing our you know loop to work or work orders 
uh, doesn't cost it anything. So if you look at this execution plan, it looks pretty deceptive. Um, now we look at the new execution plan. First of all, we got rid of the uh, nested loop and replaced it with hash match, uh, which is computationally more expensive. For the CPU, it's more expensive, but it's less expensive on the I.O. And generally, when you work with larger tables, uh, it might be worth thinking. You have to kind of balance the both. Um, OK. And now we can see that, OK, there's still quite a lot of uh, there's <coughs> quite a lot of cost in actually scanning the work order. But I can pretty much straight away see that this is a much better execution plan that I used to have before. All right. So but that's not to say that from, uh, from, from the optimization point of view, that this is totally out of, you know, never do that. No. Um, and you should always kind of create uh, a group, group sub view, for example, and join to that. That's no, not always the case. You always have to consider how much data you're going to be selecting. For example, um, if I just run this individually, that generates me 230 uh, to 38 orders. An execution plan is, well, pretty simple. We just scan in the work order table, and then we're doing the aggregate. As you can see, the cost of the aggregate itself is pretty expensive because we have to actually do a lot of CPU uh, calculations um, to get that aggregate in place. So any kind of aggregation, any kind of grouping is very expensive for the CPU to do. All right, so this table itself, work order, I think it contains something like 17,000 rows. In fact, we can actually look at the execution plan. We can see the number of rows scanned. It's 72,000, okay? And basically, if I have uh, 72,000, if I had 7 million rows in there, and if I had something like a couple, well, couple of hundred thousand products, in there that I've selected. In fact, if I then that query where I do the subquery uh, and get all the work orders and their maximum dispatch data, all this kind of stuff as a dip, as a view, and then join it to two hundred thousand products, that makes sense. However, if I have a, my selection basically generates me a very small set of data on, on about ten products, like this, there's no point in doing the whole aggregate on the uh, on the work order table. Instead, I can just scan it four or ten times because I know my product, yeah, the number of products I'm going to have is very limited, so something like ten. So it's worth doing this instead of actually doing the whole aggregate because you know, the whole aggregate is, on well, the whole table is very expensive where we can just go and read it four times instead. Okay, so in certain circumstances, this is better than this. But in certain circumstances, it's the other way. It depends on how much data you're actually going to be working with. So you always have to think about your, uh, well, you know, coming back to the relational algebra. You have a selection, then you have an output from that selection that becomes, well, you have a restriction, let's call it pro properly, from a relation based on some predicates. You get a view out of it and you push it into another uh, restriction that almost becomes like a relation. So if you come and start thinking uh, in those terms, it starts making more and more sense in terms of how to optimize your queries, how to how to make it, uh, well, not kill the server, basically. That's m our main reason for looking at the execution plans all the time. Because, you know, on my production database, I can look at it and, I mean, I can just quote, write a query and it will be absolutely fine. I mean, it runs really fast, once, less than one second, just quing. That's it, because I've got very limited data. But when you start actually think, deploying this code, start finding uh, that it literally, you know, brings the service to a halt simply because we have so many records in the, and every time we run that query, everything needs to be aggregated, etc. So that's how you have to think about it straight away. And it's more about contextual thinking also. For example, we know that we only select, in this specific case, we know we only select black products. Uh, they have certain inventory, so we already restricted that. Uh, if we have even further restrictions, then we know that the number of products are going to be less than the number of work orders. So maybe it's worth actually using this one instead. 
Although from the first look at it, the execution plan for this first query where where I have the selection as a top parameter effectively uh, looking really really nasty <coughs> because we have nested loop and all that kind of stuff. But in fact, with the large data in the work order set and a smaller data in our product selection, that might be much better. Okay, so that's um, how we can actually do the, with the views and right. Um, okay, so coming back to this, uh, where we where we I'll just delete this query. That's it. We've gone through this now. Okay, coming back to this one. Now I have created a subquery, but I don't have to do this actually. I can just join directly to work order table, and it will be fine. Any idea how I can do that? Um, don't I mean speak up? <laughs> Any ideas? How I can get rid of this table so I don't have to do a sub select effectively and I can just join directly to a work, uh, work order table and get my latest due date for every single product. Um, all right, let's give it a go. You're saying, for, first of all, what we need? The product ID is what has to tie it together, so somehow you need to pass that in as a parameter to. Room. To the join. To join, okay. So we, we got it in a join or uh, left out a join? Left out Okay. Left out a join. Production and I think work order. Okay, we'll just call it work order. All right. So it's like this, right? Well, it's there again, but yep. I'm trying to think how you're going to get that product ID to be the current row. That's the time. That's the well, that's time. that's exactly what it's going to do. Okay. I mean, we we have uh, we have we selecting all the products that are black from in uh, and then joining it to an inventory subset, which is this yeah. one, where all the uh, quantities are more than four. Um, and then we get all the inventories that are more than four, blah, 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 this kind of stuff. And then we also join, left out join to a work order um, by product ID. So for every product, we're going to get every single work order, right? Yeah. But we only want the latest one. So we run this and we can see that there's one product. Yeah, it's black. It's got two different names, which is weird. This is the uh, this is uh, this location name. Actually, let's give it a proper name then. Okay. So, so you need to put an and on the after the on. Hmm? So you on your left out to join then and 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 the max due date or no you can't do an and on the max due date. No. You're part of the weather. So effectively, we need to get them the latest due yeah, date there. Put max on that, okay. Yeah. So max on that, and will it run? No. Yeah, exactly. So it's not going to run because basically we have this as an as an aggregate, and all of those fields need to be grouped by. Move that around. Dun, 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 dun. There you go. Indeed, there is. Okay. Didn't work. Why? So we've got quantity. We've got multiple quantities for two different locations. Yeah. So we now say, right, so we need. Quantity to be summed up for, for all the locations. In this case, we get all the quantities for all the locations for a product, and then we also get the due date for uh, this work order. But you've got location name as a output, so you have. So what you've done is correct. Hmm? You've got location name as one of your output. Columns. Exactly. So you, want so. the, you want the. Yeah. So even if I then sum it up, it's not going to do anything because I'm actually grouping by location as well. 
All right, so let's progress to that. Let's do, uh, let's do quantity sum. Okay, but our uh, and we also get the rid of the quantity from our group by um, class now as well. So it should let's order it by product so we can see product ID. Okay, still multiple products basically because this is for every single location where it's got inventory we effectively do my duplicate and we're doing the Caucasian product out of those tables uh, we got uh, this product for every single location we've got their quantity because we've included location into our uh, into our grouping so if we get rid of the location from our grouping and just pay group by product information we can now do the sum and that will yield us the total uh, inventory level for all the products in all the locations and the new next uh, work uh, order due date uh, well not the next one the, ma the maximum one, the latest uh, okay this query itself that we actually created is wrong in the first place and uh, I'll explain why later on as well when we do uh, when we actually look at more well, when we look more closely at the aggregates. So, although what I wanted to demonstrate with this is that in uh, for uh, when you start doing aggregates and grouping, it's quite a good idea to consider the subqueries uh, because now we kind of in, if we wanted to put this work order in in our direct join in the left to join, uh, then things become a little messy one because you start doing aggregates and so on also if you look at the execution plan of this now uh, although it looks a little little tidier than the previous one uh, I think this was this one it's going to better okay but it looks a little tidier but in fact, it's uh, well. It looks a little tidy because it's wrong. And um, to kind of prove you that it's wrong, do you think the stock level for this product is three hundred and eighty-nine thousand? To prove you that uh, that it's not, we'll jump ahead a little bit. is this uh, this is the total stock level for this specific product and 834 not what we had before which is quite a lot more you tell me why do we get this number there why do we have the incorrect stock level for this product but for this one it's all right hey what's going on there multiple rows with null can be think about the cartesian product that we're going to generate out of joining product than location or uh, product uh, inventory, uh, which is fine because we then sum them all up. But then we also do the Cartesian product on the work order. There's lots of work orders for a single product, so we join in on them and we get a result for every single work order. We get the result for every single location, mm -hmm. okay? Which basically then multiplies our quantity, and we then just here we just summing them all up. Yeah. So that's why uh, we get the number there that is totally not right. Okay, so when you start you know, working with aggregates and then joins and then grouping them all, uh, your sums are 
well need to be checked and you have to be very careful when you do that but we're gonna talk a little about it uh, as well okay so this is how we can do exactly the same thing I mean all right what's easier this one or that mess that we ended up with would you like more not the mess not the mess. Also, it's much easier to read what the hell is doing, right? Because we know that uh, we know exactly what's happening. We can go and run it separately. We need to limit this selection as well. For example, we know that we've got some uh, parameters in, that go into the query where we know, say, product IDs uh, in a specific set, 925 or something and then 902 etc we can even do that and limit the selection even further so we don't get such a huge scan on it as well okay so our execution plan is now much <coughs> faster well our hashing or our aggregation is much faster because we've done most of the uh, work while we were selecting data Okay. You look puzzled. Yeah, no, yeah, sorry, I was just looking at it. it only got the work order for just those two, didn't it, for everything else it's ignored. Yeah. I was looking at the results as well. So we put most of the work or, uh, workload on the work order, on scanning the work order table because we're now restricted with the predicate, saying we only want those two products in there. So we spend a lot of I.O., but then we don't actually load the whole query. And in fact, this, I mean, although we only see percentages in this case, but once you start analyzing the I.O. and CPU cost, you'll see that this query is about 50 times faster than the previous one, because previously we actually done everything. So it might, might actually be worth, even when you're doing things like this, uh, to consider, OK, I, I want only black products in this query, right? So I might want to in a joint product and the product ID and I want where prod uh, color is black there you go uh, from work. there you go Group it by specific field. So there you go. That's a work order for all the products that are black. We've got the same kind of condition here, but because this is a subquery, uh, it might be worth putting the same kind of selection in there so that we actually limit the amount of data that we get back. So we can optimize our subselects as well as uh, our selects as well. Uh, don't just assume that this is a conversion product. Let's just get everything and then make SQL Server work hard. We've got a fast machine. It'll do it. It's fine. Go, five, deploy. Uh, no. Uh, always think about what the hell is it actually going to be doing and uh, how much work it actually needs to, uh, needs to generate and think about how we can make it run even faster. Because overall, I mean, it, all right, if you just run in a single query on a customer database to see uh, what what's happening, I mean, why do we have those orders here, etc. You don't care. You just run, make sure that you don't do stupid things like join all the orders to all the orders. Then you get the dub, you know, the orders in square, and then join to something else as well. And then SQL Server is just going to go. Uh, uh, but in general, when you just query in the database, don't worry about the execution plans. But we, when you write something that will be running constantly on the customer databases or queries, um, you always have to think about what, what the hell is it actually going to do? How often is it going to run? Is it going to run once an hour? Uh, is, is it going to run on demand when the customer clicks something? If the customer clicks something, you really have to optimize it because every time they do something, it hits our servers. Okay. Um, yeah, so if I just rerun this, so we can look at the execution plan again, and we can see that most of the time we now spent <laughs> on, well, it's changed a little bit, yes, uh, because we have to do join there, but most of the time it's still spent on scanning the, uh, the work order table. A lot less time actually spent on hash match uh, on the aggregation. Actually, no, that's, that, that's different. To what it used to be. All right. All right. 
if we start, I, I think with this execution plan, if we start analyzing the I.O. and CPU costs, you'll see that it's uh, it's even faster than it used to be. It's even better. Okay, and SQL uh, SQL Server is not smart enough. Uh, if we remove all those predicates in there. In this specific case, SQL Server is not smart enough to know that we only want products that, in this subquery, that match our uh, predicates in here. You can see that it doesn't actually apply the predicates in there. It just outputs everything and doing the aggregate there and so on and so on. Right. So the next thing that I wanted to um, mention is how to, well, how to use row number um, to effectively page your results. Okay. So a lot of a lot of time um, we get very large result sets out of the database. So in this case, we got 142. Yes. Well, we're not necessarily want to imagine working with the web or even with the client application, with the desktop client application. We don't want to get all the information out of the server and then. Uh, to the client, uh, let's say it's a million rows. Um, not a million. Let's say it's a ten thousand rows, uh, ten thousand records. Uh, we don't want to get them all from the server and display it on the customer screen straight away uh, because you know it's too much data for anyone to to make any sense out of. And neither we uh, well neither we want to get all the information from the server from the SQL server to, to get it to do all the work, then uh, stream it, well, not stream it, basically send it over the pipe or a TCP IP uh, to the computer, well, to the, ser to, to the client, effectively. Then that client then sends it over, over the HTTP to the web browser, and the web browser will then do the paging on the select a specific set of that data that will be uh, displaying. So what we want is we want SQL Server to say, okay, give me only rows from one to, let's say 20, something like this. And just demonstrate uh, the, uh, the usage of it. Our application, we're going to spa. Uh, I think I've got some data, I'm not entirely sure. What's my password? Anyone? No? No? Nobody knows my password? No. no. Not even me. Huh? Not even me. Uh, I'm pretty Sorry? Thank you. It's been recorded, by the way. <laughs> All right. So if we go and select a, a script of some sort, let's say now the customers, customers are we go do, 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 um, K types. I don't know. This is uh, no customers. Give me all the customers for June. Do we have any? Yes. So we've got a whole bunch of customers there, and we've got the paging there. Now I have to, I think, for this uh, video, I'm going to have to cut this bit out, don't I? <laughs> because we've got the custom information. Maybe I can blur it somehow. I will. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah. So this is what we're trying to achieve is this kind of behavior. So uh, instead of getting all the information out of the server, uh, we just say, okay, give me the first page, which is going to contain from 1 to 500 records and then on the second page we're going to have 501 to a thousand and so on okay so how is it done it's done like using a row number um, parameter <coughs> row number is actually a output expression and we're going to see how it actually works at the back end as well so where is our row number? Row number, row number, there you go. That's our query we're gonna be using. We're gonna walk through, walk you through it. All right. 
So what do we have here? We have You can me for a bit. There you go. Yeah. I will get a proper keyboard one day when we can afford it. Okay, so this is the, uh, the data that I'm getting from the server. And what I want to do is to implement a row number on each sing single row. Okay, we have this row number in SQL Server itself, but that's actually generated on the client side. So every time the SQL Server Management Studio you know, reads the row, it says, oh, that's row number one, two, three, four, five, etc." And uh, what we want to do is to get SQL Server to give us a row number based on some kind of uh, uh, ordering information. So when, what we do is we put row number over a specific order predicate. Uh, well, not predicate, that's not predicate. It's an order clause. Is it clause? How do you call this? A column. Uh, a order, a, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, basically, by specific um, order column. So, in this case, I want to generate the row number based on the quantity of the inventory table. So, there you go. We now have row number. And basically, this result set is ordered by the quantity. By the same token, I can go and say, okay, I don't want it by quantity. I just want, you know, in my result set, I want everything to be, all the pages to be generated by product name. Okay, so they're all nice and alphabetical order. I think they go. Uh, let's include the product name. That will help us to see what's happening. There you go. I'll just run this separately. All right. So, did uh, do that? Oh, yes. Descending quarter as well. That's why it's backwards. But effectively, now I ordered everything in. Uh, uh, I gave every single row a number based on the name of the product, so in the ascending order. I can include multiple order by uh, parameters in there, multiple columns, and it will behave exactly the same as we looked at the, uh, in the last lesson. We looked at how, many, how we can do multiple orders, uh, order columns in the same set. All right, so now we've got this query. We need to only select um, rows out of this query for example from 1 to 25 and then the next page in our case will be from 26 to 50 and so on so right any suggestion how we can do that in SQL server yes yeah, I, was gonna, I was hoping somebody's gonna say put where row number this stuff mm -hmm. is uh, more than one and more than 25. You think of one? What do you think of something? This part is a um, Exactly. Yes, you can't do that uh, because this is an order by clause. It needs to generate the result first and then it orders it. So if we look at this <coughs> execution plan here, let's see what's happening. We're doing some selects, blah, 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 some nested loop, which is retarded, but okay, we, that's actually good that it generated this. Um, um, so we, we're doing this, and then we're doing a aggregate somewhere. Where are we doing it? Well, no, we're doing an aggregate. We're doing sorting before we actually spit in the data out. Okay, so... Um, where does the where does the where happens? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Where does the where happens? <laughs> I mean, in, in the SQL Server, where do we actually apply the predicates? When you scan in the product in the first place. Yeah, exactly. In the scan itself, you can see there's a predicate 
uh, where quantity is four, and then we've got some predicate where color is black, and then effectively at this point we'll say we'll have to say where the row number over the product name is more than one. Well, it can't do that because it actually generates the row number all the way down there. So just before we actually output the data, this is where we generate the row number based on the data that we already have in our um, views. Effectively, let's call them views out of those restrictions. Those are two restrictions. We get them nested, nested looped and joined together, blah, blah, blah. Here we get the view. And then it happens pretty much at this arrow there. We can actually click on it and see how many rows we've got in that view. Then it gets into this and this and this. And this is where we actually do in the row number allocation. So that's why we can't do it there. As Matt rightly mentioned, uh, the way to get only the rows that we're interested in out of the server, we actually have to do a subselect. So we've got that query there. We treat it as a view, effectively, as an individual view. Give it a name called paged. And then we select everything from that view where page number, well, paged, row number is one, one or more or equals one, and row number is less than 25. And there you go. In fact, at this point, we don't even care about the row number anymore. We needed it to actually construct a subselect and then only select those rows that you know fall within this parameter. What do you think execution plan looks like now? Well, maybe your plan is going to be the same as it was previously, but then just with an addition at the front to say only pull these one that you require. Yeah. Exactly. So as you can see, execution plan up to, whoa. I don't know, it's, it's right. Up to the second, four points in the same. I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think it's it might have been exactly the same as the previous one. Sorry? You haven't been by now quantity before we were by now. Uh, it shouldn't really make any difference. Hmm? It's it's a little bit different. I think SQL Server kind of got its got its brain turned on for this one. I think it optimizes it a little bit more. But in fact, we can still see what's going on with that query, effectively. Um, up to this point, everything is exactly the same, pretty much. This is a sequence project. This is where we're calculating uh, a row number. <clears throat> top number of, and then I don't know why, why this is here to be honest the top expression we've got the so case from 25 the calls, in the sense you're saying that's the equivalent of the top 25 I suppose so yeah that's pretty smart <laughs> okay <coughs> then it's basically it's doing my sub query out of this it's doing it on those bits as effectively as a top, uh, but as a top <coughs> ordered selection, and a filter that actually does nothing. And now this is a filter. So why does it do this? Okay, but this change it to page row number uh, greater than uh, than two. Maybe we'll see what happens. When case 25 is null or 25 is, this is, uh, can anybody understand that top expression? <laughs> Beats me. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's still getting the top 25 and then it's filtering it down to the top 24 <laughs> to change the page. The top got. Pretty sure it's going to change to 28, and that's not going to yeah. tell us absolutely nothing. Yes. Yeah, it's, getting, <laughs> it's getting the top 28 rows because that's the maximum that it requires, and then you've done a filter to say only get me now between 2 and 28. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Clever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anyhow, 
So coming back to um, my initial kind of point is that we're doing all this work here and then because we're just using these results out of this view uh, to just get us some data out, this effectively SQL statement as if it's an HTML statement, it looks to you as if it's an SQL, SQL statement of some sort that we're going to be doing some scanning and all that kind of stuff to SQL Server, it looks like a relational algebra uh, method. It's not a method, it's just a piece, it's an operation that it needs to do, uh, almost like computational operation. So again, coming back to the fact that SQL Server ultimately translates everything to its own language, which is a relational algebra or calculus. Um, of course, it then you know, optimizes the whole thing massively per day. Okay, quick question on what it's doing there then and how that relates to SPA. Yeah. Obviously, so when you're doing that in terms of SPA, those will actually be parameters as opposed to fixed numbers in the query. Yeah. So if that's now on that top, returning that number, when you then get up to 10,000, does that mean it's good? And you want it posed in 500s? It's going to return 10,000 rows and then just show you the last 500. I don't think so. Let's say we want from 50 to 100. Mm. By the looks of things. Therefore, each time you index your page, it's going to it's cache in the whole whole data. Set. No, I don't think uh, this operation here. Uh, if we look at further on, put actual rows one hundred there, 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 and there. <coughs> Send it. If you start getting this only 100 rows, pretty much after this point, mm -hmm. although there's no predicate here. Well, my point being is that this top operation is not actually uh, does not actually result in a view. No. It's just doing some computation work on the actual view that we already have. Yeah, actually. So it doesn't mean that it's going to recache it, or yeah, cache it, match it, match it to something else, etc. It's it doesn't mean that it's just done some work there. Effectively, based on the uh, CPU cost, you see CPU cost. Yeah. I don't think it's done much. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So uh, to make it even easier to work with. Um, what can we do? We can actually put it in a width uh, parameter right at the top. It just makes it so much easier to work with. Um, okay, so we can do we can present this query like this. So first of all, we're doing the same select up there, think, and then uh, we're creating that as if it's a view, and then we're using that view down there. Okay, and when you need to do I mean, SQL Server is pretty powerful. I mean, this width command is actually pretty powerful because it allows you to break down your query into lots of different segments. And then at the end, assemble them all. Okay, But that doesn't mean that SQL Server is going to treat it exactly as you said. You know, what's going to, you know, this is what's going to happen. I want this view to be created and to be scanned completely independently of all the others. No, SQL Server is smart enough to know uh, but this is the, the, all this thing, kind of, all this restrictions and views and you know joints etc. They all part of one big assembly at the end. So it will effectively will treat them the right way. It just makes it easier for you to see what's going on. And hopefully I'll be able to uh, show it to you. Okay. You get why didn't we get the join? 
So we've got this execution plan. Nested loops. Yes. Okay. So this is what I wanted to show you. Okay. So this we have it as a width right at the top. Run this separately. Execution plan. Nice. Right. You join it to um, from product inventory to product location to get all the product locations. Blah blah blah. Uh, to products and then we're doing some matching sorting blah blah and then we get in the row number and some select output okay we run it as a page result which is supposed to in my eyes is supposed to take all this kind of stuff that we've got in there you know almost put brackets on top of uh, around them and say at the end almost like put a predicate where row number is this and that basically okay SQL being a smart ass decides, oh no, we're gonna go and optimize the actual query. It's done it because the number of rows and our products and inventory allows it to uh, to think of a better way of actually doing that selection. As you can see, previously we had hashed match, now we have nested loops in there. Which you know in this specific case, in this specific circumstance, the fact that SQL Server chosen this execution plan means that it's a better way of doing things. So instead of doing the selection all the way at the back, there, where I would expect it to happen, it's doing it there. And we can see that it's we got some uh, 142 rows that we're supposed to do. And after this bit, we only start getting 25 into our computation routine. Um, and also, it moved the location out of the whole thing as well, because we don't need to join to every single location every time. We need to join it only when uh, we have a product information, product data. And that becomes a nested loop as well, because we then have to go to location, and scan it again, and so on. Okay? So, bit, I mean, in this specific case, looks it's all right, but I don't like it, right? I, I like. I know that you know somewhere in the future uh, the data will increase, and I don't want to ask you also to think that we have to do nested loops just in case it decides to cache it and say, ah, it worked like this 150 times, and then 100, you know, when we populate lots of data in the tables, it's still going to do go and do the nested loops. No, I wanted to say, you know what? I want you to do a hash join. You know, I want to force you to do a hash join and tell you. Do a hash join. Don't bloody do nested loops. Don't come back. Don't think about the execution. Block. I will actually tell you what to do. So I put this nice, uh, what do you call? They actually have a specific name. They call it annotation or, you know, like hints. I think they call join hints. Yes, join hints. I tell the SQL server how to join a table. And we run this now. I pray that it's going to work differently. Yes, it did. <laughs> All right, so now we kind of switched from doing nested loops into hash matches. This is what I want. I like them. They are very expensive CPU-wise, but they don't hit our I.O. And what's more important for us, I.O. or CPU, in our specific case? I share database And CPU is not? Well, <laughs> it is shared, but we've got, we can chuck more CPU at it. We can't chuck more I.O. at it. Uh, we can check more I.O. at it by adding another drive and putting database in another drive. Mm -hmm. But if you're returning tens and tens of thousands of rows, yeah. that's a huge amount of I.O. Now think about what CPU is doing. For example, we've got four, C uh, four cores on a mm -hmm. on, on a server, and they, you know, they basically share four context switches. Yeah. And every time a SQL server have to do like a very large computation, you've got. 25, what do you call them, nanoseconds or whatever, or of a specific thread running, and you've got thousands of customers running those queries. The answer is both are very important. Uh, okay, but in certain 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 circumstances, it's better to sacrifice CPU over I/O, especially when you're doing nested nested loops. If you see in the execution plan that it's doing a lot of nested loops um, to a very large table. Well, screw it, we don't need to do it, especially if it's doing nested loops on a non-indexed field, which we'll talk about next time, maybe. 
or the time after that because I still haven't managed to complete the lesson for <laughs> an hour. Um, okay, so, but what I wanted to show with this specific case is the fact that you can hint at skill server how to do joints. You can tell it, do it like this. You can even do partial ones, let's say, like, do like half of them nested loops and then half of them a hash match uh, and so on. And then you can do merge joins and things like that. So you can go and start researching what it is actually, uh, what's actually happened when you're doing the hash match. You know, how much does it cost CSQ server to do it? Um, then you can look at what's happened in the merge hash. And then you can instruct the CSQ server to do it like this. And when you're doing your subselects, it's also very important because you can then say, okay, I know I'm going to get that much data in there. And I know I can sacrifice so much CPU for this um, selection. So I can say, you know, screw whatever, ask yourself, screw you, whatever you're going to think. Uh, I'm going to tell you to do it like this, then do it like that, then do it like that, and then merge it all together at the end, whatever you, I mean, however you want, based on the number of data that we get. Okay. Well, that's about it for today. Sorry, I still haven't managed to actually do the um, the final bit with groupings and aggregates. We're gonna do next week, and we're gonna start looking at indexes as well. Probably gonna move the stop procedures and views for the next one. Then hopefully in about two, yeah, in about two lessons we're gonna start actually looking at the client side. So how to actually use the information that we actually get out of the SQL server on your client side, be that a C sharp .NET or .NET application, or be that uh, a web application, whatever. So we're going to look at both. Okay. Right? Um, and let me stop this.